Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 30th Annual Symposium on the Holocaust and Genocide. I'm Marlene Grossman. I co-coordinate the symposium along with the Holocaust Education and Genocide Prevention Foundation. Um, this year, we partnered with the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal uh, Center for Holocaust Studies, um, as well as we are co-sponsored by the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Um, for this lecture, Michael Bierenbaum, we also have a sponsorship by the Montreal Holocaust Museum. Um, Michael is a writer, a lecturer, and teacher consulting in the conceptual development of museums and the development of historical films. He served as project director of the United States Holocaust Museum, overseeing its creation, and was a conceptual developer on several other museums and memorials. He has previously taught at many distinguished universities. In addition, he was the executive director of the second edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica and a contributing editor to the Encyclopedia of Genocide. Michael is the author and editor of 22 books, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces. Moreover, he served as producer, writer, and historian for dozens of documentaries and films. His work on films has recognized with Academy Awards, an Emmy Award, and the Cable Ace Award. He is also a consultant and interviewee on several broadcasts and has been featured on television many times. Mr. Bambo. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Uh, let me ask uh, a favor of the students, since you're all spread out, why don't those in the left, uh, uh, those on the left at least move to the right? That's not a political statement. That's a, a statement because you're spread out throughout the auditorium. Uh, it's uh, difficult to create a coherent community when people are uh, miles away from each other. Okay, thank you. Let me begin um, with a peculiar statement, which is I apologize for the relevance of this talk. And my apology for the relevance of the talk has nothing to do with the history I'm gonna present, but everything to do with the miserable world in which we live. And uh, my generation thought we had done a better job about the world. And we're looking around the world and saying, oh my God, how the hell did this happen? And uh, we have to look at that. So I'm going to do uh, three things with you. I'm going to talk historically. And what I'm going to ask you to do as I talk historically is I'm going to ask you to um, do the links with regard to what the contemporary world is. And then we'll do the links with regard to the contemporary world. But we are seeing uh, dramatically the role of propaganda, you in Canada a little bit less than we've seen in the United States, but with what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine, we're seeing the important role of propaganda. Um, let's look at propaganda in a very particular way. You may know that Adolf Hitler wrote a book in 1925 called Mein Kampf, My Battles. And Hitler, um, in the book, laid out what he was going to do. And we can, in one sense, say he said it, he followed it, he did it. And that is, he set out a um, program that included two distinct elements. One was German expansionism within Europe, German colonialization within Europe. After World War I, Germany had been shut out of its colonial holdings in the third world. And therefore it began to imagine that it would have its colonial holdings in Europe itself. And his particular target ironically was the Ukraine. And the reason for the Ukraine is the Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. And that is has incredibly fertile soil and its soil was enormously important to feeding Europe and the other part of that is during World War I, one of the reasons Germany ultimately lost the war was it could not provide adequate food 
for its population and even for its soldiers. And we're seeing a little bit of an impact of that today, ironically, with the, um, uh, with the fact that the Russians do not seem to be able to feed their soldiers and no army functions on a empty stomach. And we're going to have the consequences of the invasion in the Ukraine felt throughout the world. Because if you Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe and now we're in a globalized universe, you're gonna have food prices go up in uh, uh, the Arab world, in North Africa and the like because of the export of grain. So Hitler set up out with two programs. He set out with a program of colonialization in Europe and the idea was to imagine the United States from sea to shining sea. And the idea was he wanted to expand dramatically uh, to the new frontiers within for a world of German domination. Way to look at the Holocaust is to also see the second alignment that he had. And the second alignment that he had was a racial war and the racial war that he articulated was a war in which Germany was to be the master race. Put it approximately, those to the west of Germany were in better shape, more superior than those to the east. And the Jews were regarded at, as lowest on the totem pole of racism. And they became declared ultimately as a cancer on German society. And his goal then became the elimination of the Jews. And there's a seamless anti-Semitism to Hitler from 1919 to 1945. The last words of his last will and testament were to enjoin the German people to remember to go after the Jews. Interestingly enough, in that in that bat, my battle, Mein Kampf, in that book in which he articulated, he devotes an awful lot of time to the role of propaganda. And that is he understood very deeply and very profoundly the role that propaganda pay, plays in both spurring the population on, getting them to become part of your message and using it. Hitler also um, understood a couple of things, and we see it dramatically in two ways. He understood the power of the new medium. Now, the new medium, um, for those of you who are sitting here with more power than we had when we created the nuclear bomb, the new medium at that point was radio. And the new instrumentality of transportation that was yet in its absolute infancy was the airplane. And Hitler understood that he would have to master the use of the radio. And he also would have to understand the dramatic sense of flying over a city of all of that, the visual and the powerful that is involved in that. And he was in fact, the first political candidate to campaign by airplane at a time when all other political candidates were campaigning by the railroad. And um, you know, those of you who know Lenny Reichenstahl's uh, Triumph of the Will understand the way in which she sees the enormous pageantry flying in, coming in on top and using that. So there's a sense in which he understood and fully understood the power of propaganda and then we have to look at what happened when the Nazi regime took power. First of all, the Nazi regime gained power in, in a sense with enormous pageantry. And the pageantry was a way of massive rallies, enormously powerful color, tremendously uh, visible uh, uh, music, and then once it gained and the assembly and the sense of uh, charismatic, matic, charismatic oratory, and once it gained power, it began to think of dominating the entire medium. 
Hitler gained power on January 30th, 1933. And he had a plan to establish a one party state and in a very real sense between January 30th, 1933 and June and July 14th, 1933, he established that one party state. By the way, July 14th, 1933, what does July 14th represent? And you most, especially in Montreal, would have this answer better than any American audience. What is the symbolism of July 14th? Symbolism of July 14th, as has been called out properly, is Bastille Day. And essentially, since he was trying to get rid of the notion of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and since Germany had been defeated in World War I by France, part of the symbolism involved in precisely that. So in the period of first few months, he established one party rule. The next step was once you control the power, you have to unite the German people behind you and also to uh, get them to be part of what, to get their hearts, minds, and soul. He assigned a very particular man to this task and that is Joseph um, Goebbels, and Goebbels had a PhD from Heidelberg, one of the great then and now one of the great uh, universities of Germany. He had it and he had a PhD in literature and, and philosophy and he became the master propagandist. As head of the ministry and look at the words of public enlightenment and propaganda, he controlled the flow of public information through press, radio and film. All newspapers in the Reich were licensed. Those that refused to endorse the Nazi line were shut down. Does that echo something we're seeing today? It echoes dramatically. You can almost see a direct game plan. Uh, you know, Marlene, when you invited me, we talked about the relevance of propaganda then to propaganda now. And uh, I'm reading from, from something that was written months and months ago about propaganda, and all of a sudden it looks like a game plan. Those who refused to endorse the Nazi line were shut down. Editors had to be racially acceptable, which is a way of getting rid of the Jews. If we look today, editors in certain respects have to be politically acceptable. And you see that in a variety of different parts of, uh, of, of the world. They had to be Aryan descent. They could not be married to Jews. And some of the most venerable newspapers in Germany were closed because they were owned by Jews and forced to get rid of their Jewish publishers and editors. Twice a day, Goebbels ministry held a press gift briefing, grif, a briefing where reporters were told which events to be covered. Editors were informed as to how a story was to be treated. Ministry officials read and censored all papers, and therefore they had a dramatic flow of information. Everybody understood the ground rules. Failure to please the ministry by printing anything to weaken the strength of the German Reich, to offend the honor and dignity of Germany could result in heavy fines, even imprisonment in a concentration camp. So you either went along or you were gotten rid of, and the political pressure for that was enormous. Notice the game plan today is precisely almost modeled on that directly as to what newspapers have been shut down, what has been made illegal. And you can't even in Russia say the word war and by the way, let, before, we, before we go into that, understand that language is always used as a modality of communication and very often a modality of distortion. Um, anybody know the meaning of enemy fire, of, of uh, friendly fire? Such and such was killed by friendly fire. Let me ask you a question. If you're killed by friendly fire, what is friendly about the fire? It's essentially done by incompetence, insubordination, stupidity, malfeasance, a variety, an accident. 
recklessness, but all of a sudden we tried to get the scandal of it by language, and this is in, even in the freest of countries, we get the scandal away by language by calling it what? Friendly fire. If God forbid my kid were killed by friendly fire, I would almost be much more upset than I would if he were killed by enemy fire because what? One should have been avoidable and preventable and one is not. So language is used as a, mo a means of distortion. He also turned state st the state-owned broadcasting system into a propaganda vehicle. Now let's look at one very interesting device. In the first two years of the Nazi regime, radio usage, people who owned the radio went up from 25 to 66%. But the radios that were given to the population could only absorb German radio frequencies. And what was it, and what was a form of resistance? A form of resistance was if you maintained often clandestinely in your home and even uh, hidden from your children, sometimes because you didn't know how exposed your children were to propaganda in school and they might turn their parents in, if you had a short rave radio that got other forms of broadcast. And we understand now even that the control of the medium means that who are the people who are getting information and you see it in, in the population survey, in the surveys in Russia today. And I don't merely want to talk about Russia, but I'm, I end up looking at that. You see a very interesting thing that the older people are supporting the war in far, far higher percentage than the younger people because the older people are not skilled enough with what you guys are so skilled at, which is the computer, to be able to bypass the systems of censorship. And we have multiple sources of information that come our way. And with the multiple sources of information, you can bypass the established system, but one could not do it at that point. And that ironically is one of the reasons why the allies invested very heavily in radio broadcasts. And we continued that with Radio Liberty and Voice of America and the like with all of that type of ways of getting information into a population. And I don't have, I'll, I will talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the United States with again, the information flow and the way in which it works. The Nazi government was the first to exploit the new technology of radio. Ironically, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt used the radio to successfully further his own political goals. And you had something quite remarkable called the fireside chat. And in those days, radio was in the living room and a family gathered around to listen to the radio. So it was a collective experience. And the fireside chat was as if you had a fire going in your fireplace. And who was your guest in your living room? The president of the United States. And consequently, you could feel in that sense, uh, a tremendous uh, fireside chats brought in living rooms of ordinary citizens were effective in establishing an intimate rapport between, between the president and the American people. The Nazis marketed a cheap wireless set called the Volksfanger. Uh, Local radio wardens encouraged neighbors to buy radios. Later, they reported those who listened to foreign broadcasts who were subject to arrest. Radio reached a mass audience and became the most persuasive source of Nazi propaganda. German radio devoted its airtime to playing martial music, telling human interest stories about good deeds done by noble young Aryan men and Hitler youth and carrying Hitler's speeches, which were broadcast throughout. Hitler was a powerful spellbinding orator. In photographs, he does not appear to be uh, a pre, uh, a, a terribly impressive uh, person. Not only that, but if you think of the Aryan beast, the Aryan beast is to be a six foot two, blonde haired, blue eyed uh, hunk. 
strong, vital, vibrant, sexual, manly. And Hitler is rather short, rather meager, rather slight, dark-haired, semi-balding with a mustache, and somehow he becomes the embodiment of the Aryan beast, which tells you the power of propaganda and the power of, 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 of uh, charisma to begin to shape perceptions. Ironically, he is Austrian, not German. And he becomes the spokesman for, the, for Germany. He only becomes a German citizen literally on the eve of his election as uh, of his election. Uh, and his appointment as, as uh, chancellor. Albert Speer, who served as Minister of Armaments and who is interesting because he wrote a very important uh, memoir, said, um, said the following. I went in to um, hear Hitler speak and uh, I thought it was funny. Three hours later, I left the beer garden and changed person. I saw the same posters on dirty advertising columns, but looked at them with different eyes, a blown up picture of Hitler in a martial pose that I'd regarded with a touch of amusement on my way in has suddenly lost all of its ridiculousness. He had been transformed. The Nazis systematically created the cult of the Fuhrer, the great charismatic leader. The veterans Hitler was portrayed as a heroic corporal who had fought valiantly for the fatherland, to artisans as an artist who had um, torn himself from his studio to answer the call to serve the nation. At public rallies, Hitler worked himself up into a pitch of near hysteria, carried the audience with him. His experience as a street corner speaker paid off. Hitler knew how to touch his audience, how to gain the sympathy and to, and to play on their fears. And we should, again, indicate something very deeply, which is that fear is a very, very, very powerful motivator. And we in the United States experienced the nature of fear. You didn't have immigrants coming to our southern borders who were coming into the United States because they were desperate where they lived. You had an invasion. And the invasion are people who carry diseases. And the most interesting thing is to take a look at how in Florida, the, government, the governor of Florida said immigrant, immigrants are bringing COVID into the state. Now, if you know the borders of Florida, you understand that there is no immigration that comes into Florida that does not come in by plane or by sea or by land after being well out throughout the United States. You also know that Florida is a mecca of tourism and uh, the idea that it is the immigrants who are being, bringing COVID has a touch of ridiculousness, but the language that is used is a language that is generated to um, create fear. Demonstrations were held at night in a sports stadium and nighttime demonstrations means that the general public can attend. It also means that you're a little bit looser and a little bit lighter and a little bit more persuadable, which is the reason why many of you go out on dates at night, much more persuadable, much more uh, quiet, and in that sense, ready for a different experience. You're also free. Thousands of men carried banners, torchlights illuminated the stadium, make it seem like a th cathedral of lights or tribal ceremony. Rhythm, music, pageantry. And ironically, if you look at the pictures, and I'm sorry, I didn't bring the pictures, order, dramatic, dramatic order, not chaos. The audience held its breathless tension. Hits the speech were punctuated again and again by sh shouts of Zig Heil from the frenzy crowd. William Shira, an American journalist who reported from Berlin for CBS News, rose that Hitler's audience were caught up in the emotion that took on the quality of a religious experience. They reminded me of Crane's expression I had once seen in the back country of Louisiana on the faces of some holy rollers who were about to hit the trail. They looked upon him as if he were the Messiah, their faces transformed into something positively inhuman. And again, if you think of rallies as spiritual occasions, 
And you also see something that in many respects, um, the same types of groups who are attracted to the massive evangelical speech, speakers at the churches are precisely the groups that are interested in the rallies that have been had. It was designed to shape a folk community bonded to the leader. Allegiant to Hitler was direct, personal, and absolute. It superseded all other loyalties. Hitler's frequent companion, Lenny Reifenstahl, a beautiful film star pioneering director, glorified the Fuhrer in a film that is a classic of propaganda. It's called The Triumph of the Will, a film that's still studied and shown as a prime example of brilliantly effective propaganda and suasion. Even the opening narrative frames it as an epic. September 5th, 1934. 20 years after the outbreak of World War, 16 years after Germany's crucifixion, the feat of Germany is described as what? Crucifixion, which represent, what, um, which triggers responses in a Christian audience. 19 months after the commencement of German's Renaissance, Adolf Hitler flew to Nuremberg again to review a column of his faithful adherence. Think, so, think of the dramatic drama of that as it's coming in with a plane coming in over the stadium filled with people. All of that drama. The hour and a half long film is devoted to the 1934 rally at Nuremberg. No effort was spared to accommodate Reifenstahl. Pits were dug in front of the speaker's platform so she'd get the camera angles that she wanted. In other words, you look much larger if you're filming from a pit than elsewhere. Tracks were laid so a cameraman could take traveling shots of the crowd. Aerial views of Hitler's arrival were shot from planes and a blimp high above the stadium captured the massive crowd. More than 170 people went on the production when the rough cuts were not quite right. Major party leaders and high-ranking public officials reenacted their speeches in a studio. Imagine you get essentially cabinet officials, heads of major agencies, important personalities to redo their speeches just to get it quite right, understanding that propaganda is essential to establishing the centrality of it. When Reifenstahl's work was a masterpiece of elegant technique, propaganda in the popular press was intended to be crude. So you go highbrow, lowbrow. If you want to see two films with regard to Nazi propaganda, you see the film of the triumph of the will, and then you go down and you see the eternal Jew, which portrays Jews as rats coming out of the sewer. Highbrow, lowbrow. Getting each, each element. So you had the tabloid, their Sturmer featured anti-Semitic cartoons and fanciful stories in which Jews were shown constantly engaged in international conspiracies, ruthless businessmen whose God was money, cheating honest Germans and sex crazed monsters violating German women and children. And again, if you think of the recent accusations against uh, the woman who's going to be nominated, uh, who has been nominated, is going to be confirmed today as what the first African-American woman justice on the Supreme Court of the United States, Justice Keneally Jackson, you have something which is, is very interesting. What are they accusing her of? They're accusing her and they're accusing her supporters of being pedophiles, which again puts you in what the sense of enormous endangerment. Reifenstahl's epic work might appeal to a culture sophisticate but course movies such as The Eternal Jew were featured in theaters and most importantly in schools. Perhaps the most impressive achievement of Nazi propaganda was the international public relations effort that surrounded the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Germany hosted athletes from 52 countries on an event stage uh, on a colossal scale occasion to showcase the new Germany that had risen from the ashes of the Weimar Republic and the humiliating defeat of World War I. 
The Olympics gave the Nazis the opportunity to convince international community the new regime had been unfairly treated in the press. Stories of anti-Semitism and the suspension of political freedoms had been overstated by journalists and diplomats alike. In the United States and other countries, participation in the Berlin Olympics was a matter of controversy. Those who believe that American participation would be taken to tacit approval of the Nazi regime urged to boycott. Others made the case for the purity of the sports competition, arguing that sports and politics should not miss. They wanted the boycott, they warned that the boycott could trigger anti-Semitism throughout the United States and would threaten the future of amateur sports. Despite the setting, the Olympics were an international, not a German event, they argued. Now, think of this, folks, as to the controversy with regarding the recent uh, Olympics in China, and think of the boycott of it. This has been through since 1936. In 1980, we boycotted the um, Olympics being held in the Soviet in then the Soviet Union. In 1984, the Soviet Union uh, reciprocated and boycotted the Olympics of what. Uh, held in Los Angeles. The question of participation in the Olympics and the legitimation of the political regime go hand in hand. It's with us today. And again, what did you have? President Biden did not attend. President Putin did attend and walked hand in hand with the Chinese leader. There was a sense of an alliance, and he took that as tacit approval for what? for Chinese support for the invasion that was uh, uh, um, about to take place. In anticipation of the Olympics, Berlin was cleaned up. Anti-Semitic billboards and posters were taken down. The pace of persecution slowed and even the rhetoric of Nazis leaders toned down. Hitler was a constant presence throughout the game. His arrivals and departures were dramatically staged and he made a point to personally congratulating all German medal, medal, uh, medal winners. We all learned that Jesse Owens, the superb African-American writer, had won an unprecedented four gold medals in 1936. He spoiled Hitler's plans for an Aryan triumph. How do you have the white man's supremacy and a black athlete winning all of these medals? Exhausted after his track feats as both sprinter and broad jumper, and more than content with his three victories, Owens had not planned to run in the 400 meter relay. Two Jewish runners, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller had competed and qualified for the event. And Owens felt that they had earned the right to compete. Mac Robinson, whose brother Jackie was to break the color line in Major League Baseball and break the color line, by the way, in Major League Baseball first by playing for what team? The Montreal Royals right? The Montreal Royals, you guys hosted uh, the first African-American, the first black, black athlete to do that. Mac Robinson, uh, who was to break the color line a decade, uh, was the third member of the relay team. To his dying day, Marty Glickman firmly believed that a solicitous Avery Brundage, afraid that a victory by a Jewish athlete would further offend the German hosts had excluded two Jewish runners and ordered Owens to take the baton. So even this relay race was a manifestation of what acquiescence to the great dictators. In those days, athletes did as they, as they were told. And Glickman described the emotion that came back to him as he revisited Berlin 50 years later. This is, and Marty Glickman, you have to understand, was a uh, brilliant athlete who had a great career as a sports broadcaster and the like. This is what he said. I stopped and looked across the street stands and saw where Hitler, Goring, and Goebbels, Streicher, and Himmler had sat. And suddenly a wave of anger swept over me so that I thought I was going to pass out. How could these dirty bastards do this to any 18 year old kid and keep him from competing in the Olympic games. Roosevelt who had remained silent throughout the Olympic debate reassured his friend Rabbi Stephen Wise, president of the American Jewish Congress. Tourists returned to Berlin. Berlin um, had reported to Roosevelt 
that the synagogues were crowded and apparently nothing is wrong. Propaganda becomes an instrument, a tremendous instrument for societal control. It becomes a tremendous instrument to rally the society in a variety of ways. It becomes a means of presenting your position. And in those days, you had the possibility of controlling all means of communication. We do not have that today. What is the problem with propaganda? Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the great United States uh, Senator, who is also by training a, a very distinguished academic says, um, everybody's entitled to his opinion, but nobody's entitled to their, but uh, the, not to their set of facts. And that is that we have lost and we have a crisis, most particularly in the United States, a crisis of truth which is that people are willing to accept a variety of different um, types of things. Uh, masks are regarded as what has yellow stars symbolizing people who are about to be executed when masks are a symbol of mutual responsibility because if I wear a mask, I protect you. If you wear a mask, you protect me which is why all of us accept that as part and parcel of living in a dangerous, the dangerous world in which we live. We have people who have channels of communication receiving all their information from only one source with no dissident or other points of view being accepted. You can't say certain things and that's one of the dangers of cancel culture. Cancel culture on the left, cancel culture on the right. In the United States, you have the uh, accusation, he's a rhino. Rhino means Republican in name only. And that is because of the fact that the person may have a view just that does not comport with the party line. And once you have that situation uh, and you begin to exclude people, exclude dimensions of information, get all of your information from one source, you see the enormous power of propaganda. And we are seeing it manifest in an incredible way in the war in Ukraine, Russia trying to control propaganda, Zelensky using his own bully pulpit. And again, think of Zelensky as a master of, um, uh, he's a performer. And think of the script that he right now has, and even the idea of, I need weapons, not a ride. And think of what that represents as a symbol. And, and what is he trying to do? He's trying to get out every day in order to what? Get his message across as a counter statement to the world in which is being besieged by the other way. We also have something else that is intriguing about information today, which is um, when we studied the Holocaust uh, years ago, we believed that if only they knew they would have acted. And the problem today is that we see genocides in real time because this is an instrumentality of communication. And we understand that the issue is not knowledge or understanding of what's happening. The issue is the political will to combat genocide. And part of what has made the current war in the Ukraine so compelling is we're seeing all of the images and we are flooded with those images so that we're beginning to see the full impact of war. And in this war, we have multiple sources of information. Anybody with a phone becomes a reporter. And that again transforms the world in which we live. Last point, which is uh, again part of our world, is that in the world of today, every person has a megaphone, which is called the internet, and has the capacity for a social support network, which can fuel hatred and which can reinforce views that they have. And again, we limit the channels of our information in order to begin to think alike. Everybody thinks like I do, because what? 
all of the sources of, inf of information that I have are information that comes in a particular way. Let's take some questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Is this working? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm going to take some questions both um, both from Zoom and, and live. Um, while we're loading up some questions, I'll just ask one. Please. Okay. Um, actually, I have a lot of questions for you, but I'll try and limit. Um, first question I have, um, two questions, I'm going to ask you two questions because they're both important. Um, one question, if you can answer um, Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion. Um, especially online, has has uh, become a serious problem. Um, and even a report that was out, uh, two months ago, I think, maybe three months ago, said that a third of North American students believe that the Holocaust is either exaggerated or a hoax. Okay. Um, so if you can just tell me what how what your thoughts are on how to combat okay. Holocaust denial. Let me begin. Let me begin by saying. Um, and I'm going to use an analogy to pornography. There's hardcore Holocaust denial and softcore Holocaust denial. Hardcore Holocaust denial um, suffered a major defeat in the year 2000. And this was something called the Irving v. Lipstadt trial. Deborah Lipstadt um, had, um, had uh, written a book in which she accused uh, David Irving of being a Holocaust denier and an anti-Semite. And in the United States, if Irving had sued her for libel, uh, he would have to prove that he would that uh, she had malice and that her statements were false. In England, it's the reverse, and that is you have to prove that your statements were true. And there was a tremendously long trial that was a trial which featured some of the greatest Holocaust scholars of this generation. And more importantly, it featured brilliant research that went into it, which is that a man by the name Richard Evans and his graduate students went through every book that David Irving had written and checked every footnote and went back to original documents. Let me give you one example of where they found his distortion. He claimed that Himmler had ordered a stop to the killings and he used a document about Himmler's order in Minsk to stop the killing. If you went back to the original document, you saw that Himmler ordered the stopping of the killing of German Jews who were had deported to Minsk, which is in Belarus. And if you then asked, and what happened the next day, or the, actually two days later, you discovered that what Himmler then did was to send in mobile gas vans so that the killing did not have to be direct. And mobile killers, if you, if you wanna, I'm gonna give you a longer answer than you wanted, if you want to know the whole history of the Holocaust, you can do it in, in one simple example. First, they sent mobile killers to stationary victims. When that proved too difficult to, for the killers, because apparently you need liquor to get over killing people all day long, then you needed it afterwards, you needed it before, during, you had some breakdowns, you had a lack of discipline. So they reversed the process and that's when they made the victims mobile and sent them to stationary killing centers. And therefore they were able to combine what we call Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest with Henry Ford's assembly line. Why did Auschwitz become Auschwitz? Auschwitz had 44 parallel railroad tracks. So we go to David Irving and we discover that what he does is to distort all of the documents involved. You discover that he's uh, both a racist and anti-Semite. And since he was the best pseudo scholar denying the Holocaust, hardcore Holocaust denial became um, sort of not something anybody else tackled in that way. We now have distortions of the Holocaust. Let's go in a very simple way. Distortions of the Holocaust means that every nation tries to cleanse itself of responsibility. So if you go to Budapest today and you stand on the Danube, there's an incredible memorial of empty boots, of empty shoes standing on the edge of the Danube. That's uh, to show that in the waning days of the war, the Hungarians killed Jews, Hungarians killed Jews by lining them up 
tying them up and shooting every other one because they didn't want to run out of bullets. And the middle Jew be standing between two others drowned by the weight of the two dead bodies in the, in the Danube River. If you go today to what the Hungarian government wants to achieve, it's all Germany's fault. In Germany, you had the notion that uh, there were uh, the good German soldier and the evil SS, as if only the SS had done it, there's distortion. You go in Poland today and you're not allowed to say that Polish institutions and Polish people and Polish uh, um, uh, uh, locals were involved in the killing of Jews, even when they were involved in the killing of Jews. That is a civil penalty. So that's a tremendous amount of distortion. Up until the 1990s, Austria had the notion we were the first of, German vic of Germany's victims. German, and I took a course in German in, in Austrian history uh, in, the 80, in the 70s. And the guy said on March, on March 11th, 1938, the, Austria, the German army entered Austria and Austrian um, history continues on May 8th, 1945. Between April, uh, between March 1938 and April 1945, that's not Austrian history, it's German history. And as somebody said humorously, Austria wants to believe that uh, Hitler was German and Beethoven and Bach were Austrian. Having said that, you have distortion taking place. We also have tremendous distortion in the comparisons to the Holocaust. Let me give you a, a basic, um, let, let's go to, with, let's begin with stupidity. We have a very distinguished American congressman who spoke about the gazpacho police. Now, the poor woman had no idea what the Gestapo war was and apparently had no idea what gazpacho is. Poor woman had not what savored the beautiful taste of, of gazpacho. We also had uh, this same woman said that the Nazis gave Jews gold stars. Now, the last time I was given a gold star, I think it was in second grade. And how about you? Anybody get a gold star after second grade? Right, maybe third grade. You you were a goody goody, so you got you got a gold star. You got a gold star in in in, in third grade, right? Different now. You also have the distortion of the mass being compared to a gold star, uh, being compared to a yellow star. Mass save lives. Symbolization is one of the stages of genocide, and since symbolization is one of the stages of genocide. You put a star on the Jew because Jews are not seen from the outside. They're not, Jews take many shapes, forms, and the like. Jews are seen in America uh, and maybe in North America uh, primarily as white. They're not necessarily white. They come in multiple shapes, colors, and, and forms. And the other thing is that it's not racial in the same sense because Jews, you can convert to Judaism and become a full-fledged uh, member of, of the Jewish community. So you have distortion that takes place all the way through. You have false comparisons. There was a uh, horrific cartoon which used the gates of Auschwitz, Arbit Mach Frey. And Arbit Mach Frey, uh, work liberates, they said, vaccines make you safe. So again, presuming you knew something uh, about it. Now, the question becomes exaggeration of the Holocaust is you've had a politicalization of the Holocaust. And lots of people politicize the Holocaust, including people who really would like to preserve it. Uh, I had a piece about um, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who claimed that Hitler got the inspiration for gassing from the Mufti. There's only one problem. He had ordered the gassing two months before he met with the Mufti, but don't confuse political rhetoric with historical truth. So that's distortion. And then let's give another example. I hear people accusing the Israelis of engaging in genocide. Now, if you want to say occupation is a problem, it's a problem. You want to say their treatment of Palestinians is not, uh, you know, 
all protection of human rights, absolutely, you even want to disagree with the notion of occupation, be my guest. But if the Israelis are committing genocide, they're terrible at it because the Palestinian population is dramatically increasing. And if you're going to kill a population and you're accused of killing the population, genocide is not when the population has expanded multiple fold uh, in, a, in a generation, a generation uh, uh, in two generations. So you can accuse the Israelis of many things. Genocide is not one of them. The policies are not Nazi-like. Now, you have interesting the invocation today, and this is uh, technically a very interesting question. The definition of genocide, which is legal definition established by Raphael Lumpkin, is the targeting of people as members of a group in whole or in part for extinction. Now, the problem in whole or in part, we understand in whole, that's the final solution to the Jewish problem, the destruction of all Jews. In part, does that mean three people? Does that mean one people? Does it mean a thousand people? Does it mean 10,000 people? And that becomes the question as to whether the Ukrainians are or not uh, are victims of Russian genocide. Clearly, hundreds have been killed, maybe thousands. Is that war? Is that genocide? What is it? But you want to scream about the evils, so you invoke what? Holocaust. And the reason for that is the Holocaust has now become a negative absolute in a world of relativism. We don't know what's good. We don't know what's bad. But we know that the Holocaust was evil. I can go on, but let's <laughs> take that as a, there's, and I'll be a short one today. There's five answer. questions that are on Zoom. And okay. we have, I'm going to take one question from Zoom, and then I'll take one from the audience. Uh, so the first one, would you qualify the Western propaganda today potentially as dangerous in the long term as, as the one from the Russian side, considering the similar information coming from different yet same and interest corporate media? Well, would I qualify, would I say as potentially as dangerous in the long term as the one from the Russian uh, side? Uh, I would say not. And the reason for that is you have competing corporate media that are not necessarily agreeing with one another. And the other is that the um, Russians have declared war on the Ukraine, and it's not the West that has declared war on Russia. And Russia has entered the Ukraine under false premises. Number one, even the premise of denazification of the Ukrainian government uh, is a little bit ludicrous. I happen to have had by accident dinner with President Zelensky, who is, uh, whose uh, father, whose grandfather fought against the Nazis and whose other grandfather, grandparents were killed by the Nazis. You can accuse him of many things. Being a Nazi is not one of them. And the idea that why did, why did Putin resort to that? Because the great patriotic war was the war that everybody agreed to. So I think there is a problem with corporate interests involved in that. But the other part of it is that we live, as long as you don't have dramatic censorship of information, we live in a place in which we get information from a vast variety of sources. And consequently, the potential for controlling information is less great. Now, you see the intimidation of reporters. You see a whole range of things involved. You also, um, in our current climate, there was a, a wonderful um, uh, well, it's synonymous. Ken Burns did uh, a wonderful series on baseball, but Ken Burns documentaries are usually wonderful. It's synonymous with a documentary to say Ken Burns did a wonderful documentary. There's one um, area on his thing on baseball. He shows a, a, a black uh, athlete, we're going to call him as, as he called him a Negro athlete in the Negro Leagues who was trying to rip off his skin because he wanted to play in the major leagues. A little while later, he has Kurt Flood, who broke baseball's reserve clause, saying, I never objected to having a black skin. I just wish I had a thicker skin. And reporters who are either on the left or on the right, who are reporting certain things that a segment of the population doesn't want to hear, are finding that they need a thick skin because they're subject to attack. You have people who are accused of, 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 of uh, 
all sorts of crimes, uh, again, the pedophilia rape type of crime, were threatened with all sorts of things. And that becomes intimidating. And it becomes intimidating also, for example, when you publish the home address of certain people and all of a sudden your home no longer becomes safe, your car no longer becomes safe. And therefore you need what we call a thick skin. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that Kurt Flood reminded us is there's a difference between skin and thick skin in order to be able to take it. Hi. Uh, so I teach here part-time and I teach in other places in social sciences, history. Um, so I have two questions. The first relating to um, Holocaust education and something that I've encountered uh, recently is this, this idea that maybe we got it wrong and, and um, that Holocaust education has traditionally been about identifying with the victims and maybe we should be identifying with the perpetrators or at least enforce it or enforcing, uh, putting forward the idea that, you know, you're more likely to be a perpetrator than a hero or a victim. And I'd just like you to respond to that. The other- the Well, other let, me, let, me, uh, let me take the first question. Sure. Um, I taught for many years at Georgetown University. And Georgetown University has a School of International Relations, which uh, has a whole range of students whose uh, fathers are princes and kings. And I always had a tremendous fear that somebody was gonna take my Holocaust course and take notes, Hitler made a mistake there, let me not do it that way, let me do it this way. And that so-and-so made that genocide is more effective if conducted this way and that way. So the question becomes not identifying with the perpetrator. The question is understanding the perpetrator and, um, and the problem also becomes if you tell the perpetrator story, then sometimes understanding is to excuse. Now, I'll give you a, a, a very interesting piece of scholarship I did. I edited for the, in, uh, in English, the police interrogation of Adolf Eichmann. And I decided methodologically, I was gonna do something different than the Israelis did. The Israelis assumed that the son of a bitch was lying. And I said, um, I wanna work as a methodology for understanding Eichmann, not that he was lying, but these were the lies he was telling himself. And what do I then understand about Eichmann if I begin to understand what he's telling himself about what he did? And I wanted to use that, and I, I wrote the introduction in two, two things, where he's lying and where are the lies that he's telling himself. So for example, when he said, I was just following orders, that shifts responsibility. And he said, you know, I never, I never killed a Jew. That's interesting. He never did kill a Jew. In fact, uh, what he did was to essentially deport about 2.3 million people to death camps. And he said, once they left my jurisdiction, I was not responsible for what happened. So I began to understand the bifurcation of responsibility inherent in bureaucracy. And I used that as a methodology to understand. We had a debate uh, 20 years ago between um, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen and Christopher Browning called the ordinary men versus ordinary Germans I, debate. I've read that, I've read who, that transcript. Who were, who were the perpetrators? Were they Germans who had gone from eliminationist anti-Semitism, get rid of the Jews to exterminationist anti-Semitism, annihilate them? Or were they ordinary people who slowly became transformed into killers? That led us to understand the perpetrator. Now, we are more likely to become bystanders, enablers, than we are to either become victims or perpetrators. Some of us have enough morality left in us that we're not going to be perpetrators, but lots of us go along uh, and don't have the courage to stand up and stand out and the like. So your second question, sir. Thank you, that was, that was great. But the second question relating to propaganda, and you, you touched on it, uh, you know, Beijing Olympics and things like that, China. Uh, I mean, the Russians are good at propaganda, but 
the Chinese have been completely controlling information in a way that I don't think we've ever seen before. We're finding ironically that the Russians are not so good at propaganda, which is that their efforts here have been a little bit crude and dismissive. Um, and you have, um, um, in one sense, you have a, a greater fluency in the West with the cultural traditions of Russia than you do a fluency with the cultural traditions of China. And the Chinese have a different, have a different type of, of, of system. Chinese also have a different type of deal, which is they've given essentially economic freedom uh, as opposed to not challenging the system. And the economic uh, freedom seems to be working in the sense that you've moved lots of people from the peasant class to the middle class in a dramatically uh, uh, significant uh, short period of time. Let me say one more thing about um, um, China, which is that China has a much longer term view. And that is that, um, and, and this is a, at the risk of prediction, why would China get involved heavily in this if it's winning the economic battle at this point and if it sees itself in millennia and not in hours and weeks? One of the terrible things that, that we have in our culture is we can't do long-term planning because we think in short-term. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine who was largest envelope manufacturer in the world when we used envelopes. And he said, I don't know how to make, he never went public with his business, even though we could have gotten billions of dollars for it. He said, cause I don't know how to make money on a quarterly basis. He said, I bought a forest the other day. This is 20 years ago. I bought a forest the other day. That's never going to make a profit. But if there's ever a paper shortage, I can create my own paper. So I can do that. If I had to report quarterly earnings, I couldn't put that on the books in order to do that because it would lessen my performance. So we don't, we sacrifice, and we have this with the instant polls you can't do right because you got to figure out what the polls are, what your popularity, you're up, you're down. Imagine uh, going through a, a, a marriage in which every day you take a poll about how good your, you know, your, your marriage is. You know, yesterday it was, uh, I had 82% support and today I, I you know, I, I didn't answer a question and I have 17% support. One of the things that most of us enjoy about marriage is a relative stability that we understand if we screw up, we have a relationship tomorrow and the next day, as long as we don't really screw up. But you're going like, you know, if you're taking polls, I, I, I owe my wife a, an answer to pay our taxes by April 15th on what we paid for uh, earthquake insurance. And she's annoyed that I haven't given to her because she can finish her taxes. So I'm now down in about the 9%. Tomorrow, when I come home and go to my Quicken on the books, I go up to about 85% because I can answer the question. So, you know, that's, that's the way. Yes. Thank you. So a few more questions on Zoom. Um, were the propaganda machines and the resistance in the European countries, aside from Germany, similar to the Nazis, or were there small differences? There were small differences and there were large differences. Let's begin that one of the forms of, one of the very important, uh, and, and we're understanding this today in a dramatic way. Um, our, uh, there's a historian by the name of Werner Rings who said that there were four forms of resistance. In my work, I call it defiance versus armed resistance. There were four forms of, of resistance in every country uh, under German occupation. And he said, uh, one of them was symbolic resistance. The other was polemical resistance. The third was self-help and the final was armed resistance. Symbolic resistance was to resist dehumanization in a number of forms by normally by symbolism. The best example of that is Primo Livi's description of one of the people who washed his clothes in dirty water in the camp and put them on wet because he wanted to remind himself what, he wanted to remind himself that there once was a day 
when you change your clothes every day and you put on clean clothes in the, in the morning. And that was symbolic resistance. There is, um, we have in a museum we did in Illinois, a bra made of a knapsack by a woman um, who wants to preserve that minimum of physical di dignity given by being able to put on a bra. And again, that's a symbolic type of resistance. Polemical resistance is resistance by words. When Zelensky said, I don't want, I want weapons, not a ride. That's a tremendous form of polemical resistance. Tremendous form of polemical resistance. By the way, humor can be polemical resistance. Um, let me give you one example. Uh, and and uh, I could go into this, but a child is asked in Warsaw Ghetto, what would you like most of all if you were Hitler's child? He said, I'd like to be an orphan. That's polemical resistance in which he's killing Hitler in his mind and everybody's laughing. Because of course you'd like to be an orphan. Orphan is normally pathetic, but if your father was Adolf Hitler and he died, you know, let's celebrate, you know, uh, et cetera. And the third is self-help, which is the way in which the community comes to their, their own help. All of those are forms, forms of resistance. With regard um, um, uh, of, to current events, how about Trump's role in all this and Fox News? Uh, the, you know, uh, I can go into that for an hour. I can go into it for two minutes. Trump uh, understands, um, because he was a media person, understands the power of the media. He has an intuitive sense of how to go low. And he has an intuitive sense, and this is why we pick up um, on what Trump says. He has an intuitive sense for the uh, weakness of his opponents. So um, um, uh, again, uh, Sleepy Joe. Now, nobody's asked him, tell me if Sleepy Joe was really that sleepy, how come they stole the election? And nobody's asked the other people if they stole the election for president, why are you legitimately a senator and the like? And Fox News is, especially in its non-news programming, a propaganda machine. And it's a propaganda machine, which is one of the most dangerous forms in the United States. It's, dis it's divisive, it's nasty, it has uh, elements of, of, of uh, total and complete distortion. And Trump uh, is a profound danger to American democracy. The other major thing, let, let's give a, another example. You have um, the people closest to Trump have indicated how absolutely um, uh, how absolutely thoroughly and completely narcissistic he is that he's only interested in himself. And you have the crazy situation in the United States in which our evangelical community sees themselves identifying with a, a man who's committed adultery on, on multiple occasions, who's never had an act of compassion, who has no empathy. And if I read uh, Christian scripture correctly, uh, Jesus identified with the widow and the orphan. And my teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel said of the ancient prophets that they afflicted the comfortable and they comforted the afflicted. And that was the task of Jesus as well, who lived in that tradition. Uh, we have a group of people who wanna comfort the comfortable and afflict the afflicted, which is the antithetical of religious views. And the most deepest of all religious views is humility. And Trump has been accused of many, 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 many things, but never humility. So uh, we are all creatures of God. And at some point we get on down the equivalent of our hands and knees and, and have humility before God. Uh, and the least humble of men that, that I've ever seen in, in public life. And he's got a lot to be humble about. Um, are there any other questions in person? No? Okay. okay. Sorry, go on. Please. There's, there's no more questions online either. So. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming and spending time with us and for that very informative session. Um, thank you to the.
Montreal Museum uh, for Holocaust to, of, uh, of co-sponsoring this event. And thank you all for watching. Thank of you, thank you all in person. And uh, I hope you come to the next presentation, which is at 12 o'clock. Um, Terry Glavin, journalist with the National Post, will be discussing Afghanistan. Thank you.